Hello, everyone, and welcome to SaxWorks. My name is Rachel Sklar. I'm the VP of Programming and Content here at SaxWorks. So excited to have once again our regular Thursday at 1 p.m. installment of Learn with the List. Today, we have Natalie Nixon telling us how to unlock our creativity at work or <laughs> wherever you do your work. Um, and I'm going to uh, throw it over to Anne Choquette, who is the founder of New Power Media and the CEO of The List. Uh, to kick things off. But first, I just want to let you know a little bit about SaxWorks. We are a new membership club for life and work. We have two wonderful locations in New York in the Saks Fifth Avenue flagship with beautiful views of Rockefeller Center and St. Paul's Patrick's Cathedral. And uh, we have a beautiful location in Brookfield Place with views of the Statue of Liberty. So it's like a really New York experience. And Saks also a real New York experience for those who have been so initiated. We also just recently opened in Greenwich, Connecticut with a, a beautiful restaurant, Ruby and Bella's. So please come visit us. And how can you come visit us? I'm so glad you asked. You can go to saxworks.com and you can sign up for a complimentary date pass and come visit us at any of our locations. So with that, I'm going to uh, encourage you to come see us in real life, enjoy all of our programming and everything Saxworks has to offer. But right now you're gonna enjoy this, which is Natalie Nixon and Anne Choquette and learn with the list. So thank you so much and take it away. Thank you. I'm still new at all this Zoom stuff. Hi. Um, Thank you, Rachel. And I'm so thrilled to see so many people here. I see new faces. I see old faces. Um, I see some people who are not have don't have their face on camera, which I think is um, really wise after last week's session with Leah, where we all learned how to turn off our self view. I think that's a really valuable skill. Um, I am thrilled for this session today. Um, when we designed this whole series, Learn With The List, we wanted to send everybody off into 2022 with strength, with power, and with creativity. And that is where Natalie Nixon comes in. She is the author of The Creativity Leap. She is the founder of Figure Eight Thinking. Um, she is inspiring to me because she's also a magical salsa dancer my favorite one of my favorite facts about her um she's going to lead us through a um a, a um an exercise today and so if you have a piece of paper and a sharpie nearby you will need that i am going to turn it over to natalie i will come back for questions and answers to help facilitate that and i will be here with my sharpie doing the exercises with you Natalie, awesome. take it away. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, thank you to the entire List community. Thank you to the SaxWorks community. I'm really excited to be here with you today. And I appreciate the time that you're taking out of your day to join us. And I hope that uh, you'll walk away feeling equal parts energized, inspired, as well as equipped with some practical tips and takeaways and tactics for how you might activate and operationalize creativity in your life and your work. So as um, Anne said, what I'd like to do today, I actually, I'm gonna share a little context first. I'd like to spend like 10 minutes sharing some context. If you, if any of you would like, um, if you afterward, if you're, if you're interested in some of the images that I share, you like um, a copy of my deck, I will provide to uh, Anne at the list as well as to SaxWorks um, a, a, a link where you could have access to that deck if, if that's of interest to you. Um, I have a little gift for uh, you guys today. And then we're gonna dig into trying to like play around with this framework because you're gonna quickly see I'm a frameworks nerd. Um, I have a really loopy background in cultural anthropology, fashion, uh, design thinking. I'm a recovered academic. I was a professor for 16 years and I have been um, enjoying my entrepreneurial journey as, a, as the president of Figure Eight Thinking for the past, I mean, year five and it's been amazing. So let's get into it. I'm going to share my deck, my slides now. And like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to time myself because um, I really want to keep to my word and really make sure it's more about you guys doing and sharing. So my timer set for like 12 minutes. So let me share some some context here. So um, I'm contextualizing what I'm sharing in terms of leading with wonder 
and rigor. And um, that will make more sense to you uh, by, by the end of our time together. Um, there's three things. This is kind of where the plane's going to land. And again, I'm, I'll share images with anyone who's interested. Also, these images are all over my website as well. Um, but I'm going to share with you three original ways that I, I've been developing framing creativity. One is the Wonder Rigor Framework. The second thing we're, we're, I'm going to share out is about the three eyes. And the last, which is where we're going to really dig in and play, is four ways to problem solve using uh, my frameworks. I want to actually start with an image that um, became quite iconic for a lot of us. This was from the December 2020 uh, cover of the New Yorker magazine. It's by the wonderful, wonderful cartoon illustrator Adrian Tomine. It's called Love Life. And as you can see, it's an image of a young woman on a virtual date. And she's got a cocktail in one hand. She's got her smartphone device in the other. What I love about his work is that the more you look at it, the more details you see. So if you look really closely, you see she hasn't shaved her legs. There's a little hair stubble on her legs. The kitchen sink is full of dirty dishes. She's got some opened and unopened wine bottles on top of the fridge. And behind her, her screen, her bed is undone and her floor is a bit of a hot mess. But the reason why this image really mattered to me and was significant to me is because it does such a great job of capturing what I call the blurred boundaries that we're all trying to navigate right now. Blurred boundaries between work and home, home and play, play and learning, learning and work, et cetera, et cetera. And in order to navigate those blurred boundaries, it's not a matter of picking which one we're going to focus in on the the this new reality is about blurred boundaries um, it's more about figuring out our new true north in order to navigate those blurred boundaries um, what i know to be true these days is that in a world where we can work from anywhere and where we can learn from anywhere those organizations teams companies environments the work at the intersection of these three things will be the ones that flourish and thrive. And those three things are productivity, tech, and meaningful human experience. Now, as a creativity strategist, I advise leaders on transformation. I do that through the lenses of creativity and foresight. I'm a global keynote speaker, I'm an advisor, and I'm an author, I'm a writer. And what I have seen among my clients is that they typically have two out of the three of these nailed, right? They're, they're humming along in productivity and they're trying to figure out maybe which tech, tech platform that will optimize the productivity, or they may be a tech firm and they're trying to figure out how to get better in the pro productivity piece. Um, what is lag, what, where the laggards is figuring out where in this virtual work environment, this hybrid working environment, how they can optimize meaningful human experience and connection internally among colleagues, as well as client facing. I'm a bit biased, but in my view, the through line between all three of these, the way we're going to really optimize all three is through creativity. Creativity is not a nice to have, it is absolutely a must have, especially in this time of the fourth industrial revolution, the trains left the station is the time where tech is ubiquitous. The, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, casualties in terms of you know, basic tasks being taken over by tech in this environment, but there's a lot of opportunity to allow more of the human to show up. So I want to spend a little time really quickly. I just want to go through some interesting statistics. I find them interesting, at least about how pressing creativity is increasingly becoming in our world and in our work. Um, since 2016, the World Economic Forum has been ranking creativity as the number three job skill for 2020 and beyond. Still case, the furniture design company has done some great research. They learned that 55% of people want to be more creative in their role, but 19% are pointing to a lack of guidance or permission to be creative. And still case also sliced and diced the numbers generationally. And they learned that millennials and centennials are showing a lot more creative ambition than older workers. Fidelity investments in the, in the financial services sector, they learned that 58% of millennials are ranking the quality of their work environment over financial remuneration when they're evaluating a job offer. 
so the 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 opportunity to amplify the creativity really matters to them and this should matter to us i'm gen x because of the younger folks who are coming up uh, behind uh, people like me thinking about succession planning and thinking about how i can be better interconnected with people younger than me to optimize my work and then the degreed the research has done some great uh, studies where they've learned that 46 percent of people report that they're more likely to leave their employer if they don't see a commitment to upskilling and reskilling and creativity is wrapped up all up in the business of upskilling and reskilling. So these are the numbers that really excite me about how significant creativity is increasingly becoming. So I keep dropping the word creativity. I call myself a creativity strategist. You're within your rights if you're wondering, well, how the heck does she define creativity? I'm glad you asked. A lot of the time um, in my work, I get invited into companies to help them build cultures of innovation. And early on, I had this creeping sensation that we were going about it the wrong way, that we were missing a step. I would hear things like, oh, I'm not a creative type because I can't fill in the blank, sing, act, paint, draw, dance, or the creatives will take care of it later, like after the important stuff. And the creatives were typically referring to design teams or, or subgroups within marketing. And I realized that in my view, if we really wanted to build cultures of innovation, we needed to start with creativity. The challenge, of course, is that in most of the hallowed halls of corporate America, if I led with creativity, people look at me like I have three heads because they don't really understand what creativity is. We conflate it with art and artists only. And if we ghettoize creativity in the arts, that's actually not fair to artists and it's not beneficial to society at large. So I did a lot of thinking and research and work about this. And while yes, it's true that if you think about musicians or have this idyllic view of painters or dancers who are trained and skilled at telling story through movement, yes, these are supreme examples of creativity because artists are exceptional at intentionally setting aside the time and space to wrestle with the ambiguity of the creative process. But what I have come to understand and my work points to is that the best engineers, attorneys, accountants, teachers, farmers, plumbers are super creative when they're doing the following. When we're toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems and create novel value. So this book that I wrote, The Creativity Leap, is really um, and a, an offering, it's a provocation to offer a simpler and more accessible way for us all to be thinking about creativity as toggling between wonder and rigor. I interviewed over 50 people who came from law, uh, perfume industry, farmers, Salesforce, NASA, our family plumber, um, and, um, and time and time again, this toggling between wonder and rigor played out as the ways that they optimize creativity so that now we can understand that creativity is actually a productivity play. It's essential for our productivity. It is fundamental for our well-being and it's a competency. It's something that we can exercise and get better at when we're intentional about toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems. And that's the case for artists and designers as well. If I can dive a little deeper into what wonder is, wonder is about curiosity, audacity, uh, pretending, dreaming, awe, and pausing. It is literally impossible to wonder when you're going 80 miles an hour. You have to slow down. And I was really thrilled to, to learn that really uh, intellectual heavy hitters like Socrates uh, uh, gave credence to wonder. Socrates said that wisdom begins in wonder. And then centuries later, the Jewish theologian and civil rights activist Abraham Heschel wrote that it's wonder rather than doubt, which is the root of all knowledge. Rigor, which is the second fundamental domain of creativity, which we often forsake, is about practice focus, intentionality, time on task, discipline. Rigor is not particularly sexy and it's often very solitary. And it is, it is the one of the most essential, it is the essential counterpoint to wonder in um, developing our creative practice. And Leonardo da Vinci, the original Renaissance man himself, he famously said that any obstacle can actually be destroyed through rigor. 
But I didn't think it was enough to say, okay, toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems. Off you go, you're be creative. How do you actually activate it on a consistent basis in your life and work? It's through the three eyes. And the three eyes are inquiry, improvisation, and intuition. Inquiry is about learning to ask new, better, and different questions. Questions are inputs into a system. The system could be, what's our new marketing strategy? What kind of team should we develop? Uh, what's our next, right? The more diverse the inputs, the more diverse the questions, the more innovative the output. Improvisation is about being experimental, adaptive, self-organizing, and intuition, which we don't touch in business school, medical school, or law school, yet every successful leader acknowledges the role of intuition in the strategic decision-making. Intuition is about pattern recognition. Sometimes I call intuition brain feelings. Uh, lately, I've been diving into for my next, uh, probably be a big part of my next book, uh, something I'm calling invisible work. I don't, I'm not referring to the feminist definition of invisible work that, that um, uh, often undermined, undervalued work um, that women do along the gender divide that is totally unappreciated and underappreciated. I'm talking about if we think about the Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule, the invisible work is 80% of the time when we are doing the work that's not trackable. It's the observation, the reflection, the framing and reframing of questions, the intuiting, which is so critical to the final conversions in that last final 20% time that leads to the output of the work. And so I want to share, and this is where we're gonna get into a bit of playing around with some of these ideas um, this two by two that I made up. And this is actually part of a card game that I developed called the Wonder Rigor Discovery Deck. I actually created the card game before I wrote the book. And I created the card game. I did about 18 months of prototypes of this card game with my clients because I was trying to figure out how could I help them situationally. Oh, there's my timer. I will stop. I'll get now to you guys. So, let me just wrap this part up. Situationally, how can you, based on the situation at hand, how can you figure out how much wonder and how much rigor you need to add into a, a challenge that you that you've been wrestling with? And it's a series of question prompts. But we're going to play around with this two by two uh, for like the next 20 minutes or so. And then I'd like to have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to share this again, but just FYI, this is the gift that I referenced. Uh, if you guys are interested in the Wonder Rigor tip sheet, please go to this dedicated link. It's bit.ly forward slash WR hyphen list. And um, it's 16 ways to amplify wonder and rigor in your life and work. And uh, all of you who download the tip sheet today, one lucky person is going to uh, receive, we're gonna do a random drawing. One lucky person will receive a signed copy of the Creativity Leap. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. I'm going to pause and see if I can answer maybe one or two questions, if there are any, and then we're going to get into the exercise. So are there any questions or comments? I know that was a lot. <laughs> You're good. I'm going to just jump in really quickly because yeah. I, I do have a question. Um, and also an appreciation that you talk about rigor alongside wonder because that the um, the idea that creativity should just come to you, right? That it is magic, that you are snatching it from the air um, is really problematic if it doesn't come to you and you start to feel um, like something's wrong with you. Like every, like it's like it's other, right? Like creativity is outside of yourself. Um, and I won I I wonder <laughs> if um, there is a trick or a technique or a suggestion you have for um, starting that snatching, right? Mm -hmm. to, to jumpstart your practice of wonder and rigor. Yes. Well, the short answer is to read the book, but um, I'll give I'll give a few techniques. So one is to become a clumsy student of something like anything. 
like if you want to become a better poker player, you want to learn like auto mechanic stuff or, or you want, in my case, um, I'm a clumsy student of ballroom dance. There's three, so what, what happens, um, oh, the bit.ly link, I will share it in the chat. Thanks for asking. Um, let me just share that really quickly. It is bit.ly forward slash wr hyphen list. That's the link. Thanks for asking. Um, so it, when we are clumsy students of something, we're not the smartest person in the room. And it actually gives us the opportunity to exercise those three eyes. Because when I am a student of right now, I've been learning um, a, a short choreograph choreography, my teacher of, of a hustle. Um, I, I get really good at asking questions, um, deep observation of how my peers um, catch on to things. I wonder, I can ask them how they do that. I learned, I have the opportunity to learn from a range of different types of teachers. You have to improvise in this particular form of dance. And I also have to intuit a lot. I have to really be embodied, which is a lot of the part of what I'm interested in when I talk about invisible work. We have been valuing in the industrial age and the information age showing up to work for, from the chin up. And my perspective is that the opportunity now in this fourth industrial revolution is actually to show up to work from the gut up. Not just from the heart up, but also from the gut up. And there's a lot of this really interesting science about the neuroscience of creativity, about the vagus nerve and um, the physiology of how we are like hardwired to, to intuit a lot more. What's happening when we are clumsy students of something is that it is activating the neural synapses in our brain um, in ways that like, like the heads down work that we typically do this in the frontal lobe, like this when we have to intuit and improvise and 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 figure out how to reframe the question and ponder a little bit and just like wrestle with like i don't really know what to do next it is activating different neurosynapses in different regions of our brain and that tra my cockamamie theory i don't have the scientific evidence for this at all but that it, it transfers over into my daily work i'm a lot more confident with my clients to ask the silly question, which often opens up a whole interesting pathway. I'm a lot more confident to try to improvise and tinker in my, my work at hand because I realize the world is not going to come to a grinding halt if I make a mistake. In fact, the, one of the biggest, two biggest lessons I've learned from being a, a Columbia student of dance, of ballroom dance, is that I'm going to make a mistake. Like, it's not about like, well, I'm going to make a mistake. It's about the recovery. And the second lesson I've learned, and I actually posted about this on LinkedIn, is that ballroom has exposed me to the value of following and how following counterintuitively has opened me up to really incredible lessons about leadership. Um, and I'll share that link of that, of that post with anyone. Um, the other thing that we can do um, so I'll just share two tips. One is become a, a clumsy student of something. And the other is something that Jerry Hirschberg, who was the um, head of design at Nissan, he created this term called creative abrasion. And whenever his design team was working on a design challenge, he would intentionally invite people in from HR, finance, manufacturing, marketing to also work on the challenge. Now, he did this knowing that most of us hate collaborating. Because we're like, oh my God, I could do this so much faster by myself. Why do we have to bring these people in? Now we have to like explain what we do. We have to break down our jargon and we have to ask them questions about their jargon, right? He knew that while that discomfort causes abrasion and friction, the net result of abrasion and friction is energy. So why not convert that energy into something positive? So, so what does that look like in our everyday work? Creative abrasion means bring in people who come from who have a totally different skill set than you. Show up at a webinar and, and, and design thing we call this lateral thinking in a very different domain and, and, and connect with someone who to, to chat through a problem you're working on. Um, it could either be as in the micro environment in your home. My husband is in a He's a friggin' ERISA attorney. He does tax benefits law and executive comp. So sometimes when I'm working with something in my world, if I just pitch it to him and, and this is a clarifying question he'll ask, I'm like, oh, okay, I never thought about it in that way, right? So there are all sorts of ways we can insert new perspectives, questions, remember questions are inputs into a system in order to 
um, shine new light on what we're working on. So those are just two tips, and Okay, awesome. So um, let's get started. So, so take your blank piece of paper, and at the top, I just label it with a challenge slash opportunity that you've been noodling with. It could be on a personal level, it could be on a professional level. It could also, it doesn't have, it could be a statement, it could be a phrase, it could be a question. So let's label the top with this question. And I'm gonna do it too. Okay, so you have your opportunity slash challenge at the top. Next, you're going to draw a two by two, a big old two by two quadrant, which is just two intersecting lines in the middle of your paper. With the question, challenge, opportunity at the top. Now I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and I'm going and you can, if you want, you can take a screenshot of this to help you remember, but I'm going to go through what each quadrant is about. And then I'm going to share, share with you the prompts. There's going to be three prompts that we're going to go through. So let me share my screen again, which is here. Okay. We're going to, oh, woo. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My lamp just dropped. Hang on. Sorry about that guys. Hang on just a sec. Okay. All right. All about that Zoom life. <laughs> it's a little reckless sometimes. Okay. Share my screen again. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So here are the four quadrants, and I'm going to start and just 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 note in small letters because I really want you to to. The first problem, just, just to let you have a preview, the first question I'm going to ask you, well, you've already done this. You've thought of a challenge or an opportunity that you're working through. The second question is going to be in your, which is the way, which is your go-to way that you would typically deal with this challenge? Now, here are the four modes. Let's start with the lower right-hand corner. And this is all about the domains are, the, the extremes are wonder and rigor, right? When we are approaching the challenge with lots of rigor and we're being a bit more literal, which is what it needs sometimes, that's what I call specialization. And this is when you need to do a deep dive, refine the details, and you don't need or want to take on many risks. That's the specialization mode. And if you are a doodler, which I hope you are, just doodle a little like ribbon in this quadrant, like right around here. So that's specialization. If we move clockwise over to the lower left quadrant, another way that you might tend to deal with this opportunity challenge is through hacking your way through it, right? This is where you need to rely on your current knowledge to try new methods or approaches and do things really quickly. You need to duct tape your way through something. Totally legitimate way to approach problem solving sometimes. And then if we move up in the upper left hand corner, sometimes you need to be super provocative. This is when you need to think very expansively and bro blow the roof off the mother, as I like to say, you need to blow up the status quo. That's when, you, that's when you're in tons of wonder, tons of freedom. The invent mode is, I like to say invent is when you spent time with your head in the clouds and you've also been spending time in the trenches and you're ready to be a thought leader and a market leader. You're ready to invent. So my question to you is, based on this question that you have at the top of your piece of paper, put the letter P in the quadrant. P will stand for present state. What's the way that in the present state you've been dealing with this challenge or opportunity? Have you been tending to specialize? Have you been tending to hack, provoke, or invent? So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to noodle on that and just draw a P in the quadrant that makes sense for the present state.
that was my handy dandy timer. By the way, I use uh, time timers like a maven because creativity actually loves constraints. Creativity loves constraints on our time, on our budgets, on our access to people talent. Um, and time is a wonderful constraint for creativity. At a certain point, it's got to be done. You got to move on. Okay, so you've identified your present state way mode of working. I just I just want to make a comment about these four modes. When I first started playing around with this idea, I used to call these archetypes. And then I got rid of that label because what was happening is people were saying, oh, I'm a specialist or I'm a hacker or I'm a pro provocateur which was missing the point I was hoping that would land. What This is not Myers-Briggs. This is not like your personality type. What I want you to start to embrace is, is being more nimble and adaptive about how you try on these four ways of problem solving. Think of these as like a pair of eyeglasses that all of a sudden help you to bring a new thing into focus. Sometimes you will need to specialize. Sometimes you will need to hack. Now, it's absolutely true that we each have like our go to way that we're much more comfortable way of working like I love living in the provoke space, I could do that for days. Where my discipline and and where my where I need help is is getting into the specialization phase other people love. The, the details, the weeds, the minutia of, of bringing in specialists to, to, to do X, Y, Z, and it can really zoom in, right? And maybe they need more, they need more practice in the hack mode of provoke, provoke mode or invent mode, right? But so don't think of these as like, I am X, Y, Z. These are lenses. These are like the pairs of glasses that we can try on. Okay, so now you've identified in my present state, this is how I've been dealing with this particular challenge. Step three is I want us to think through a very new way of dealing with this challenge. Like what if instead of hacking my way through this, what if I really got, I tried on the, the pro provoke mode or the specialization mode. The, the invent mode tends to be kind of for the end when you've really done several rounds of this. So here are my prompt questions for you. What's a new future state way to deal with your opportunity or challenge? What would need to be in place to make that new way of working possible? Think about people, think about resources of time, of money, um, any other sorts of resources that you would need. So what I'd like you to do next, I'm gonna give you 90 seconds. I'd like you to put the letter F in the, your future state quadrant of how you're gonna to try to work through this challenge. And I want you to jot down some notes in terms of who are the people, what are the resources, and how much money do you think you need to work through the challenge in this new way? And let me just stop sharing for a second and ask, are there any clarifying questions before you do that? Anything that doesn't make sense? Okay, cool. So I'll share the slide again. And I'm going to give you 90 seconds to work out through your future state way of working. Please begin. Clarifying question. Is that supposed to go into one of the, you're supposed to pick a quadrant and put your future state in there? Okay. Yes, you are. Exactly. Great question. Got about 20 seconds left.
Okay, have five seconds left. Awesome. Okay. Um, what's this next slide? Okay, that's it. All right. So, um, <laughs> what I thought we could do then is um, share. Uh, if we could um, maybe like, how? What do you? What do you think, um, Anne and and Cheyenne um, and Rachel about maybe like five minutes? of smaller breakout groups to share. And here's what I would suggest share if there was an aha moment, if there was a light bulb that went off, if you have a remaining lingering question, that's why I would suggest we use this time to like break out into, could we do random groups of three? I'm gonna toss that to Cheyenne, who was our, our Zoom Meister. Yes, I'm just going to retake being host and then I think we should be able to do that. Yeah, so so let's try that guys. Let's let's have you share in smaller breakers of just groups of 3. An aha moment an insight or a lingering question. You 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 can choose whether or not you want to share what your challenge opportunity was. It's totally up to you. And then um just 5 minutes and then I'd like to come back as a larger group and have more conversation, questions. Um, hopefully there are more questions. Um, so let's try that. Let's go for just five minutes. All right, sorry everyone. I'm not quite sure if we're able to do a breakout room since it's a Zoom meeting. Can we share here? Natalie, yeah, can we all share, share openly? I, I, I think that um, it may be because it just wasn't set up in advance, but that's totally okay. No problem at all. So I would love to We're hear- We're our way out of this problem. We're gonna exactly. come up with a new solution. Exactly. I'd love to hear from anyone who's willing to share um, what's what came up for you in this process, what stood out to you. Um, and if you'd like to share the opportunity challenge you were working through and what came up, that, that would be awesome. I will share. I will jump in. <laughs> I will be the guinea pig. Thank you. Um, and I, I love. First of all, I made my notes here, but I also have like pages and pages of notes. Natalie, I'm. I really appreciate this framework. Um, my challenge that I'm facing is a really nuts and bolts challenge, but it's one that I've been working through for a couple of months now, which is making a new hire for the list. And so I'm down here, I'm starting down here where I'm doing my research and I'm talking to people and I'm in the weeds of figuring out the details. Um, because we are a small organization, um, and because our resources, our human and financial resources are tight, I need to be up here in coming up with a new um, uh, framework for how this will work, right? For um, how do I compensate someone? How do I find that magic someone? Um, how, do I, how do I cobble together a job description that is unlike what other people are doing. So this is the, this is where I would like to be. The question, awesome. the questions that I've just said, the how and the why, that's where I don't have answers yet. I have, I have provocative questions, but I don't have, um, that's okay. Know. It's it's all the questions actually lead to the bigger aha moment. So when it came to so you you in the future state, the way you like to work through this challenge of a new hire is in the provoke domain. Is that right? I think this is I think this scenario is one of those. I'm I'm traditionally like, what are the nuts and bolts and what is the contract? But I think that this is this is creating a new framework. Okay, so um, when you thought through the prompt of what would need to be in place to think more expansively about this, what did you think about in terms of different sorts of people to maybe uh, inquire or a different organization to 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 um, poke around in and to ask for advice? What, what came up? 
Well, that's a really good, I, it didn't until you just said it, but that's exactly, see, look at, I'm already like, I already got my money's worth. Um, okay. So, so like in, um, so, so I, I referenced when I was, when I was going through the slides that, um, I don't know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with design thinking. I actually edited a book some years ago called strategic design thinking. Um, and one of the things that design thinking really values is lateral thinking, which is when you look at near and far adjacent sectors to inform how you've been looking at a problem. So for example, um, let's say you are trying to design a new sort of um, mouthpiece or, or something or something related that something some kind of oral device you could talk to makeup artists you could talk to dentists right you could talk to who who are who are the 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 weird kind of outlier sorts of experts who work with that part of the body that could really inform the way new ways of thinking about this thingamajig that you're designing so similarly when you're thinking about hiring, um, you know, what would people in the theater do? How, how do people in the theater go about hiring, right? They have these things called auditions. Um, how do people, um, if you're trying to hire a kindergarten teacher, what type of, of process would you take them through? Maybe it's, it's, it's a bit more tactile. Uh, maybe you actually want to see um, take them through an exercise. You want it, maybe you want to see some sort of portfolio. Maybe it's a bit more visual. Maybe it's not just a, like a one dimensional resume. So by starting to think about where else in the world do people need to hire? So that would be the framing question. And then you, be, to, in order to provoke your thinking, and then you begin to seek out, well, who do I know in the theater? Who do I know in elementary school education? And just have a conversation with them. And, and, and what is, is amazing is the new, uh, sorts of approaches that will occur to you as a way just to get started. Thank you. I appreciate sure. that. Woo! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh gosh, my little cube light suction thing is, is not, not going well. Hang on a second. Your lighting is excellent though, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. I try. <laughs> um, all right. With the fact it's falling over. Yeah. Okay. Would anyone else like to share? I'd love for, for one or two other people to share and, or, or ask broader questions. Um, I'd be happy to share. Um, I'm Cheryl Hauser, and thank you so much, Natalie, for this. Um, I'm a filmmaker and a public speaker. And um, in my public speaking, I have also created this three-step methodology of storytelling, engaging empathy. And what I have found in the past year and a half um, is my my inspiration my like inner spark has been like extinguished so what's interesting about your quadrants is i will always default now to hack and specialize and what i really need to do is lean into that wonder element and find my inspiration again and i think a lot of it has to do with you know, the past year and three quarters going more and more and more inward, where I would get my inspiration and energy from being in community with people. And um, so a lot of it revolves around fear. Yes. Now. Yes. So I thank you for sharing that. Um, so so two two reflections this is not like a solution for you at all, but maybe maybe it will be like a golden thread that will lead to something for you. Um, Interestingly, for me, this past two years, one of the things I've really started leaning into more, and maybe this sounds weird because I think a lot of us feel in isolation, but I have, I have committed for 2022 to gift myself more times of solitude. And what that looks like for me is I, at first, um, it was just, you know, because I, 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 I was able to gift myself um, uh, like a, a small retreat in the Berkshires uh, of just before Christmas time. Um, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to do this like every year. And then I was like, so I was talking to someone else who, who told me this, she shared the story of how 
decades ago when she was a new young mother, she was in a cramped New York City apartment, two little toddlers. She was reading up on the Dalai Lama, then heard that he was coming to the Beacon Theater. They lived near, nearby and she, she went to see the, the Dalai Lama. And this was during the time when he didn't have um, translators with him. So it was really hard. She called like every other phrase, but what she walked away with is he talked about, we must commit to solitude. You need to have like one day a month where you are to yourself. And she said, she thought, okay, I'll try to commit to that, but how the heck am I gonna do that? And what she decided to do was just one day a month, um, she had the means to book herself into a hotel and just take a cab to a hotel and order in room service and you can you you can make it structured and try to journal but you don't have to but it's just kind of this way to vacate but what that also is it's it what it also says to me which is my second um reflection back to what you shared um cheryl is the value of travel now i understand we're in a pandemic our travel is limited however for example i live in philadelphia Traveling does not necessarily mean I have to visit um, Seoul, South Korea or Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, travel could mean I visit for a day a neighborhood in Philly, because Philly is a city of neighborhoods. I, I go down to South Philly and I just spend a day walking the Italian market and having a coffee and a cafe that I, I rarely would ever go in, walk certain blocks that I never would walk. and. It, it's a way it's, it's micro travel right so when you talk about that kind of feeling of depletion one of the things we know to be true is that travel helps to re-energize us travel helps us to see differently travel helps us to um ask for help in ways that we typically would, would never think to ask for help travel helps us to all of a sudden make uh uh, we juxtapose things that we typically would have never juxtaposed because we we can say, ah, this reminds me of how we do it back at home. This this tastes like this that I usually experience. I never thought of doing it that way. Or maybe it's just the way uh, people are designing the, their window treatments, or you know, we're we're a front stoop culture in Philly. Maybe it's something something like that, right? But there are still ways that you can create those opportunities to recharge um in kind of like what i call micro travel so that those are just does anyone else have any reflection or, or responses to what cheryl shared no thank you natalie i mean i agree i you know that's exactly i mean i get my inspiration by being in community with others and by traveling and seeing different worlds and also recognizing our shared humanity in that and so it's, I just, I, it's hard for me to be, you know, to get that in, but you're absolutely right. We all have to find that wonder in everyday life all around us and get yeah, out of and, our houses, just get out. Yeah. And I see Leah and Susan have their hands up. I just want to also just add, you know, I have a background in culture anthropology, which I mentioned being an anthropologist for the day, like the other day. And this may seem like not a stretch, but it actually is. I don't have little kids. I'm a stepmom. We have a 21 year old. She's in college. I'm, I'm working on a new website launch. So I went with my photographer yesterday to, to do some outdoor street shots. And we were at this um, public school. And once upon a time, I was a kid, but I was just fascinated by these little kids. Like they were like pouring out the doors and they all had like these funny little hats that they had made from construction paper and like observing what they were talking about, like being an anthropologist for the day, like just pretend you are a total foreigner, like, like that's so interesting. I mean, you'll be amazed at what begins to sparkle for you um, that, that, that reignites something. It, it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be extreme travel. It can, it can be these, these little micro journeys. Okay, thank you for that, Cheryl. Let's hear. I think it was um, was it Susan or Leah who had her hand? was it Leah who had her hand up first? I think Leah, and then Susan. I'm sorry. Yeah, Leah, and then Susan. Please share. Hi, Natalie. Thank you so much. This is really blowing my mind open because I don't think I realized how constrained I've been feeling by my creativity. And I love the way you talked about constraint and creativity. But I'm feeling constrained, and I think it's because I, I didn't realize like where I was. <laughs> And I love a framework and I've just been so much in the deep dive and that's like where I live and that's where I'm most comfortable. And I'm writing a book and 
this just made me realize how much I want to be up here in wonder and freedom and uh, just less on this bottom part. And also up here feels like sharing it with the world. Yes. And that's what's not happening right now. Like, and I've been like putting it off, but the book is here, it's out, it's there. And now I, I need help to actually make it real. Awesome. So um, I developed a course called the Wonder Rigger Lab. And because of the way I work, I prototyped it first and I prototyped it as like an in-person um, uh, group, group, group course um, back in the, the winter of 2020 is when I prototyped the course. And one of the things that was an outgrowth of, of learning for me and developing this course is that um, I developed this exercise, which we, uh, which I call um, oxygenate your ideas, right? So anyone who's had any kind of grounding or training in the arts and design and dance, it's called the recital. In um, a lot of art, it's called a work in progress. Or um, in um, it, in uh, yeah, or you know. So so anyway, you in, in 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 design studio, it's called the crit, right? It's it's your half baked idea. It's a work in progress. It's not perfect yet. You're working on this piece. But there comes a point where you have to oxygenate your idea. You have to give it air. You have to give it light, which is terrifying <laughs> because the answer could be, I don't get it, or like, so, or, um, okay, or like, I don't agree with XYZ, ABC, or, you know, anyway, it, it's it's like, it's, it's paralyzing because you're like, what if no one likes it? What if what I'm saying has already been said? What if what I'm saying is stupid? I mean, all the things I understand, been there, done that, still go through that, right? But oxygenating your idea, and, and again, so this is during COVID. So I had to create, I created this list of 32 ways to basically oxygenate your ideas another way, prototyping your ways through, through social media. So like, what if you did a five day IG campaign or Twitter campaign where you just like leaked out a little bit of your kind of, you ask people for feedback. What do you think about this? You know, maybe you get two responses, maybe you get 20 responses, I don't know. Or LinkedIn, whatever your, your jam is, right? But we, we, one of the things that happens when we oxygenate our ideas is that um, we're surprised. Like, like stuff that like sticks, we would never thought that's what people, oh, okay, that's interesting. Because that's that now you you because like really one of the things I've learned is like yeah writing a book it feels like it's for ourselves but like not really like if no one's gonna like it's really has to be for for people so we do want to understand like what sticks for people like what matters to them like what is resonating so oxidate your idea just like try in small little itty bitty steps to like give people a little piece and then wait and see see what comes back I love that. And that will help the process move forward. I love that. Thank you, Natalie. Awesome. Thank you. Susan Sawyers. Hi. And then Nicole. And then I think we're going to have to start wrapping up. Susan. Thank you so much. Um, I loved the idea. Um, my aha moment kind of came in the question process of thinking about being creative or not the pressure of being creative, but just the opportunity. My challenge right now is to declutter my digital data, which is overwhelming and it's not fun and so my normal thing would be you know the hack and you know who can I rely on to help me with this but it's become paralyzing um so then I immediately move over to specializing and um the future person would you know think deeper about my resources and then I was thinking wow like the list is an incredible resource like there's probably mm -hmm. someone here who's had this challenge and then um but I'm, I'm still stuck, you know, when I, I, I'm looking at your three, your overlapping circles, it's like the technology, which is really guiding my life instead of the, the fun stuff, which I think is the experience and the productivity. So I, I got excited and then I just got like weighed down. So, so, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. And um, I wonder if it sounded like you started to mention, um, you, you did ask, I think a really important question, which is who could I get to help me with this? And one of the things that I've had to learn 
in order to scale and grow my business. I mean, it's actually what Anne shared and it, it's actually, it is absolutely an essential step is that um, we have to learn to delegate. We have to a ask for help. By the way, if you want to read a really great book to, to help you to ask for help, read um, The Art of Asking by, um, she, she her, her punk rock band is called Dresden Dolls. What's it called? I just forgot. Amanda Palmer. Amanda Palmer. She's amazing. Yes. So read Amanda Palmer's The Art of Asking. That helped me immensely. But um, start delegating. Like some of the things that start to happen that paralyze me is I think, oh, my stuff is so precious. I'm the only one who could understand this. Or it's super private. Like I'll be embarrassed if they see X, Y, Z. Like they act, it's not that deep for other people. They're like, what did you mean by this? Okay. Does this make sense? Okay. I could try this. And then it's like you get released and relieved to do the other stuff that your beautiful brain is designed to do your beautiful brain is not designed to, to probably to uh sort and sift through all, all that all that data um so, so that's that and I, I so 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 thank you susan i just want to get to nicole's questions we have just like a minute left hi nicole hi there so mine is more of a challenge or burning question. Um, so I started out, my, my problem, my challenge was to come up with a concept for a social media cam campaign for this, um, this client, which is um, this yeah. career uh, physician world. Um, anyway, so I'm presently in the specialized area. I you know, know how I normally go about creating a campaign. And then when I, uh, where I want to be is uh, for the future state is provoke. And when I thought about your questions, what resources do you need? Um, who might you talk to? Um, when I looked at the list, it looked like a list that I would make in the specialized arena. I'm like, that's the list of things I would do to come up with a social media campaign. So I, I, my, my, I guess my puzzling question is, um, you know, how do you get out of your own special area of specialization to answer those provocative questions in a way that that is different than you would normally do it out of your area of specialization um uh, i'm actually this is a great question for us to land on because it really can bring us full circle to uh something i shared that i'm starting to get, become really interested in which is the value of embodied work a lot of what you described in the way i interpret it is that that's like the work that's like where we're it's like all in, we're in, we are in it. We are all in our heads, right? And I'm reading a wonderful book called *The Extended Mind* by um, Anne Murphy Paul. And what I love about her book is she's talking about like how what in a like the the model of the brain has been a, a disembodied one. We either the, the metaphor of the brain has either been brain as computer or brain as muscle. Uh, versus the metaphor she likes is um, brain as being is 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 like this this built this concocted bird's nest that needs to take from the bramble over here and the discarded trash over there and that's how it builds it builds something right so one of the other tips I didn't share this but another tip I really recommend is is daily daydream breaks. And the daydream break could be 90 seconds long if you can afford it it's five minutes long. But we have to integrate the practice of walking away from the work and pausing and getting back into our bodies and feeling. So for me, it's a brisk walk. I have like different types of, I, I know my five minute walk, if that's how much time I, I know my 30 minute walk, I know my 12 minute walk that I can, whatever the day can afford, right? But our brains are, you know, our spinal cord is an extent, is literally an extension of our brain. And we forget that, like, we need to move. We need to move in this world in order to reactivate those connections we need to, to, to make when we start to feel really stuck like that, from my perspective. Okay, I'm sorry, we went a little bit over. <laughs> I'm so grateful Thank for you. you, Natalie, in this conversation. I feel, um, I really wrote down everything oxygenate your ideas the daily daydream um i love creativity loves constraints i think that that's so valuable um one of the things that i just want to sh quickly share is that i flagged a page in your book where you said um inquiry or curiosity is the foundation because without the ability to ask questions you cannot be self-reflective you are stuck 
asking questions is really a way of thinking. And so I appreciate so much that rather than coming to us with solutions that you came with us, came to us with a framework as you described a framework geek or a nerd, what did, however you described it, yeah. <laughs> that you were really into frameworks. And I so appreciate that um, because it's so, um, it's so easy to hold on to and take with us on our walk into the world. Yeah. And plug and play and twist it and extend it and, and um, revisit it. Um, and thank you everyone for allowing me to share. And I hope that you stay in touch. Follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. And um, again, I'll if you're interested, if anyone happens to be interested in the, the deck, I'll share links later with uh, Anne and Saxworks and um, download the Wonder Rigger tip sheet. That's a great place to start too. And uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. you Saxworks for hosting us today. Yes, thank you, Saxworks. And thank you. Oh my gosh, uh, Natalie, that was incredible. I, I have filled this out. I have, uh, I have work to do. Um, and I also wrote down creativity loves constraints. Um, so I look forward to finding my creativity in the constraints that we all definitely seem to have these days. Uh, please, everybody, I'm going to just like, I'm going to talk for two seconds, give you a chance to go to the chat get everybody's information, do all your following. I'm also gonna put my email in, in the chat. I know a lot of you have my emails, but it's my, my Saxworks email. If you uh, have ideas for programming, or if you'd like to come in for a tour or get that complimentary day pass, I would love a reason to come in and to see people in person. Uh, so again, you can go to saxworks.com and get that complimentary day pass. We really want you to just come see because Talk about creativity. What's more creative than being surrounded by a lot of plants and either the Statue of Liberty or beautiful views of Midtown New York and nine floors of shopping beneath you? I, for one, think it really can't get much better than that. Um, so now that you've had ample time to go to the chat and make sure you've got all the information you need, Thank you again for coming today. Thank you so much, Anne and the list. This partnership has been delightful. Natalie, I am absolutely thrilled. This session has been so helpful to me personally. And I know that people have gotten a ton of value out of it because I've been receiving messages saying they're getting a ton of value out of it. So uh, we look forward to having you back and everybody, thank you for coming to learn with the list at Saxworks. And we hope to see you in person soon. And we have another one next week at one. So see you see next week at one. All right. Bye. Thank you.